Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan, oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Welcome this evening. Hallelujah. Got some announcements to make for you. The uh, first, I think, probably top of the list is we got a, uh, a new kick over uh, in the clan. And uh, oh, what was she when she came home? Four pounds, ten ounces. Now that's really nice for a bass. If you was bass fishing and you got a four pound, ten ouncer, that'd be a keeper. Would that be a keeper, Don? That'd be a keeper right there, buddy. That's a keeper right there, I'll guarantee you also. Faith, right? What's her middle name? Faith Lillian? Faith Lillian. Five pounds was when she came into the world. And, and uh, I'm sure a little redheaded. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a dominant thing there. And, uh, well, congratulations to the Keekover family. And uh, they're watching online. Congratulations, Mom and Dad. And... Uh, and then, then uh, Fred and Tipcott moved in. Well, they at least got moved. I don't know if moved in would be the proper term. They're in boxes, I'm sure. <laughs> what, if you don't mind, what is your address? Do you know it right offhand? <laughs> if you get to Nashville, go 463 miles north. <laughs> yeah, just text it to me. Text it to me. It's like when you ask people, like, well, when's your anniversary? You're like, I don't know, man. Or like nowadays, what's your phone number? I don't know. I just say, call Sue. That's what I do. All right. Okay. What else we got going on? Anybody else been sick this week? Have you been sick? What'd you have? Yeah, girl. Oh, man, it hammered me. What, it, Janice had it? If I hadn't started drinking again, it got real bad. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, man, I was down for two days, and even today I'm not quite what I ought to be, which is not, that's a pretty low standard. I'm still not there, and, uh, so I'm going to work our assistant today. I got my message done. I thought, man, I don't think I can get through that and, uh, and do it justice. So, uh, yeah, and don't forget all our people, man, we got, I, mean, I don't know if we got any of them back from spring break yet. So, uh, yeah, we had almost 60 gone for spring break, so we'll get them back. What's the matter, TJ, huh? Oh, Gloria, what are you doing, girl? You want to come up here and sing? Huh? Oh, it's all right, Ma. Buddy, that is a mama right there. 
babies in both arms and a <laughs> God lover. Hallelujah. That's what I was talking to <laughs> Robert. I said, How's Eloise do it? Oh she oh she was fine. Just walked through the door and she bumped her head on the door as I was carrying her through. I said, Man, I used to use that excuse too and my <laughs> kids need just a little extra poop. Oh, sorry, man. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Since I was talking about the boys or the girls, I'd never do that to the girls. Yeah. Of course, we did drop Hannah on her head. That's been the whole run of the thing there. All right. Savannah, what are you doing? You making a mess back there? Savannah's probably spilled her coffee. And man, are you in trouble. Ah, get her, Barb. Don't let him off, man. <laughs> All right. Well, Let's have a word of prayer, then we'll get our civics training in. What else I got for you? I think that's about it. To Don. Happy birthday, Don. All right. Okay. We haven't done this for the new people. We've never done this. They've never heard this one. So we're going to break it out again. It's been years since we've done this. Happy birthday, uh, happy birthday, uh, you're one year older and closer to death, happy birthday, this is your birthday song, it isn't very long, hey, there you go, <laughs> it's been a while since we've done that, so most of you are like, some of you are like, what was that? We started that in our old building. One year older and closer to death. <laughs> Nothing like was that uh, brother Veldhoff used to say, cheer up, believer, you'll be dead soon. <laughs> Love it. Miss the old guy, man. Yeah, amen, buddy. All right, well, we'll have word prayer, and then we'll do uh, Gabe's got us ready to go back there for the, for the uh, civics moment, and then we'll get to rolling, all right? Father, I want to thank you for today, and... And again, the uh, safe travel and move of Fred and Tiff, and Lord, your, your blessing upon their dear family as they get settled in here for a while. And, and Lord, thank you for bringing them our way. And, and Lord, I think of uh, a little faith coming into the, the world. What a blessing it is to be able to see a, another baby being born to a Christian family that will raise that child in your nurture and your admonition. So I do pray for John that you give him a, a, a great deep drive to serve you, to love you with all his heart, and to lead his family and set the pace uh, straight. That the kids would be, uh, be easy for the children to follow and uh, come to love the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, do you think of those our folks who are traveling? You'd watch over them, the churches they're in tonight, that you'd be a blessing to them. And some of them may be watching here with us this evening. I look forward to what you're going to do in our heart tonight. Father, I need you to change me. Father, we need revival, revival of prayer, revival of soul winning. God, you'd burden our hearts for Bible study. And, Lord, you'd change us to be fashioned more into the image of your holy child, Jesus. I love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, if you would there, Gabe. had bought tickets to each night and they sat back and they watched and the second night one of
And uh, but on the other side, what can you not do? Yeah, ecumenism. You can't give up your Christian doctrine for the sake of what the world calls loving. Right? That that again that paves the way for one world religion and put everything down and we'll have one great high priest who will set himself in the temple of God showing himself that he is God and the whole world will worship him of course we won't be here at that time but uh, I'll tell you what things are just rapidly moving yes Barbara hmm. correct that but see that's part of that ecumenical movement your doctrine doesn't matter and so as long as you're a good person and you have Christian values, which is what the world wants. They want the Christian morality without the Christ of the morality. Well, he's not Baptist. So, uh, you know, or if he is, he's an ecumenical Baptist, which they're out there. And it depends on how, how determined you are with your belief. And if you want to be accepted by the whole world, then you let some of those things go by the wayside because it's a sticking point that you are, well, as one, yeah, well, there's just different points. I'm going through some things that I've been accused of and not, not being a team player in Christendom. And my reply was, we may not be on the same team. So I don't know that, you know, I'm just saying. Yes, you have something? Sure. Yeah. As long as <clears throat> Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. But on the social side, they're doing great work. To be commended, applauded, amen to that. On the spiritual side, you've got you can't compromise that. And so that's what we have to hold on to is that what does the Word of God say? And it's a non-negotiable. It's simply non-negotiable. And, uh, and so that's why when you hear that, that's why I felt I, I need to, we need to discuss that just a little bit. Um, as, you know, are there Christians that are Mormons? I'm sure. As I've stated before, most faiths, if they've heard the Word of God, they've trusted Christ, you know, as their only hope for forgiveness, um, then the Bible says they're born again believer. Um, now, do they go on in that faith? That all depends. I think, uh, you know, um, how many people were, no, I don't want to get all the church history side of it, but yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you ever wonder why, why Paul had, or why God had, the, uh, the, all the teaching on we're doing women in the church? Why the majority of that comes out of either Galatians 3, uh, great as Diana of the Ephesians, right? Um, what was she? She was the part of Aphrodite. Aphrodite was the goddess of reproduction. I want to word that nicely. Um, so they had temple prostitutes. And so uh, Corinthians, the Corinthian women used to be called that too. That if you're a Corinthian woman, you're a prostitute. And, uh, sensuality. And what is our country gravitating toward now? It's an all sensual movement and uh, sensuality. So, yeah. So I better get out of here and let him do his thing. You got something? He said you wasn't done. He's just going to wing it. I did that. I told him, I said, get that message. And he was supposed to preach two weeks ago, and I got back on vacation, and then I preached. I said, dust that thing off and give it to us tonight. Amen. So, all right. All right. If you turn to Exodus chapter 20, please.
Exodus chapter number 20. All right, Exodus chapter 20, and if you'd look at verse number 1, please. And uh, just before we read, what is Exodus chapter 20 known for? The Ten Commandments, yes. I love the Ten Commandments. I hope you do too. Exodus chapter number 20, verse number 1. The Bible says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of what? Bondage. Okay? So right after he says this, he goes into the commandments. Many people think of commandments as bondage. God is saying, I've, I have liberated you, and now I'm going to show you how to stay liberated, how to stay free by keeping these commandments. Um, now skip, skip down with me, uh, please, to verse 13. And will you, let's read this all together, please. Exodus chapter number 20, verse number 13. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word, and thank you for the wonderful blessing it is to be able to preach tonight. And Father, I just I want to be um, a help and an encouragement to your people. I ask that your spirit would edify us and work in our hearts through your word, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. On uh, March 18, a few weeks ago, this article was published on the Epoch Times. The title is Black Firearm Owners, Gun Control Hurts Our Communities. And it was funny because I had been wanting to preach on what the Bible has to say about weapons and self-defense. And so I read this article and I thought this would be a good, a good place to, uh, to begin tonight. I'm not going to read it in its entirety, but I just want to read some of it. It says, During the pandemic era, gun sales boom, 21 million sales-related background checks were conducted in 2020, according to an estimate by Firearm Industry and Trade Association. African Americans and first-time gun buyers were the groups that registered the biggest jumps. The wave of new gun ownership slowed in 2021, but still appeared to be stronger than pre-pandemic levels. The rising tide is felt at Smith's organization, a person they're interviewing, which adds about 800 new members every month, he said. The total membership stands at around 45,000. He says, millions of black folks who never bought a gun now have a gun, and they start to question the narratives about guns they heard previously. When they go have a conversation with their local officials, even if they are voting Democratic, if that official says something negative about guns, they will say, hold on, hold on. I am a gun owner too, and I'm not a bad person. So what do you mean by that, he said. His group has opened the door to black gun owners of all party affiliations, whether Democratic, Republican, Libertarian, or Independent. I'm going to skip down just a little bit. He says, as a boy, excuse me, as a boy, Hayes spent years in Mississippi, where almost every household owned guns. At 18, he moved to Chicago's South Side, and was shocked to find that the only people who had guns were criminals or police officers. Later, he read to find out why. He found that the city had tightened gun control during the tumultuous 1960s under Mayor Richard Daley, and went further during the crime wave in the 1980s under Mayor Jane Byrne, who steered through an ordinance to ban handguns, including the affordable 38 Special Revolver. While the handgun ban was ruled unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court, and eliminated in 2010, its former existence had drilled into the minds of many inner city blacks that it was illegal to own a gun, Hayes said. That includes Hayes' mother-in-law, who lived in Chicago and had long thought it was illegal to own a gun, a mindset she carried with her even after moving out of the city and passed, and passed that down to her daughter, Sierra Hayes. Growing up in a middle-class suburb, Sierra Hayes never wanted to have anything to do with a gun, Aside from her mother's influence, she said she was also influenced by the constant association of guns with black criminals in the media and on television. Subconsciously, I long had this notion that a black person with a gun was a criminal and a white person with a gun was a patriot, Sierra said. It took years of rational conversations between Sierra and David Hayes, her husband, 
for her to break from that mentality, she said. In 2020, she bought her first gun. Now the Hayes teach their three children about the Second Amendment and gun safety. Sierra Hayes also brought, uh, brought her family, including her mother, to a shooting event. Hayes often travels from his suburban home to the south side to host free community classes on gun safety and responsible gun ownership. Today, politicians in Chicago continue to use gang violence as a cloak to push for more and more gun control. A lot of times, black people don't compare the laws to the actual crimes, and they don't see that most of the guns used in gang violence are illegally acquired, Hayes said. These policies will not stop the gang violence. They only hurt the legal gun owners. I thought that was worth reading and starting with that tonight. Here we have people using common sense to come to a conclusion about weapons and self-defense and public policy. And most of us probably appreciate what they had to say. But tonight, I want to focus on what does the Bible have to say about this? Is it acceptable with God for us to carry weapons? Is it, is it acceptable with God for us to defend ourselves? Does the Bible even address such things? I believe the Bible does indeed deal with this issue, and we're going to consider it in three points. First of all, we're going to consider the distinction between murdering and killing. The distinction between murdering and killing. Um, and then, and then uh, we'll go from there, so I'm not going to tell you there too. Okay, so first of all, the distinction between murdering and killing. Will you say that with me, please? The distinction between murdering and killing. Look at Exodus 20, verse number 13 again, please. Thou shalt not, what? Thou shalt not kill. The translation kill uh, can be a little misleading here because some people interpret this to mean any and all taking of life. But that can't be what it means. Because in Genesis 9-6, God lays down capital punishment as a foundation for human government. Look at what this verse says. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Why? For in the image of God made he man. Every single person is valuable because we bear the image of God. And so if you kill someone, then your life should be taken. Notice, God does not say that he is going to execute the murderer. He says, by man shall his blood be shed. So in Genesis 9, God is starting over with Noah and his family. This is right after the flood. And he lays down what one man has called the foundation for human government. If someone murders another person, the convicted murderer is to be put to death. And Paul talks about capital punishment also in Romans 13, when he says rulers do not bear the sword in vain. Why do you bear a sword? To execute someone, to put someone to death. The point is this. God would not condone capital punishment in Genesis 9, and then in Exodus 20 contradict himself, right? So clearly there has to be a distinction between murdering someone and killing someone. Does that make sense? So, Exodus 20, 13, the sixth commandment is prohibiting murder, which would also include suicide, abortion, euthanasia, etc. There are several Hebrew words that are used in the Old Testament that refer to taking a person's life. Let me just show you two of them up here on the screen. The top one there, did somebody just walk by there? <laughs> okay. Whew. All right, I'm not seeing things. I thought maybe I was hallucinating or something. <laughs> All right, let's get re we'll refocus here. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so, there, so these are two of the words that are used. That top one um, is, is uh, used to describe murder. And then that bottom one, of course, is, is a very common one used many, many times in the, in the Old Testament. Used to describe the execution of a convicted murderer or simply someone's death. Now, notice the distinction between the definitions. Do you see the distinction between those? If you turn to numbers, actually, don't, don't turn there. I'm just going gonna, gonna to put it up on the screen so it'll be a little easier. I'm going to point out the, uh, the words here. But this is Numbers 35, uh, verses 15 to 18. I'm going to show you this distinction between these words. Okay, 
Um, so at the top there, verse number 15, Numbers 35, These six cities shall be a refuge, both for the children of Israel and for the stranger and for the sojourner among them, that everyone that killeth, that's actually another Hebrew word, any person unawares may flee thither. And if he smite him with an instrument of iron so that he die, he is a murderer. You see the distinction there? The murder, uh, excuse me, the murderer shall surely be put to death. And if he smite him with, a, with uh, throwing a stone wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Do you see the distinction? The murderer will be put to death. Not the murderer is murdered. <laughs> the murderer is put to death. There's a di distinction here. Verse number 18, Or if he smite him with a with an hand weapon of wood, wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. So you can see from this passage the clear distinction that God is making between murdering and killing or putting to death. Once a person has been tried and found guilty of murder, it is not murder to put him to death. Will you read that with me? Once a person has been tried and found guilty of murder, it is not murder to put him to death. <clears throat> so God's not contradicting himself. There's a distinction that he makes between murdering someone and killing someone. And I think this distinction right here, I think it is absolutely crucial to this whole topic of weapons and self-defense. Because if all killing is morally equivalent to murder, then you and I probably shouldn't carry a weapon. <laughs> because we might accidentally murder someone. Okay? Does that make sense? Do you see where I'm going with that? So there's a distinction between murder and killing someone. Okay, that's the first thing, and that's foundational. You have to understand that. Secondly, let's consider some passages that support self-defense and the use of weapons. We're in Exodus 20. Just turn over to Exodus chapter number 22. Exodus chapter number 22. I did love what they said there about the, um, the Old Testament law and how many things are commanded in the Old Testament that are not repeated in the New Testament. For example, bestiality is not repeated in the New Testament. And so, but we know that's wrong. How do we know that's wrong? The Old Testament says that that's wrong. Okay? Um, Okay, so Exodus chapter number 22, and notice with me, please, verses 2 and 3. <clears throat> Actually, let's just start in verse number 1. If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. So he's talking about stealing, right? Stealing, making restitution. Verse number 2. If a thief be found breaking up or breaking in, and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him. For he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. Okay, very interesting. So in verse 2 here, we have an example of a burglar breaking into someone's home at night. In verse 3, we have the same example. The only difference is what? Did you notice what the difference was? Yes, verse 3, it's during the daytime. Verse 2, it's at night. Okay, that's the difference. So if a thief breaks in at night, did you notice it? It was considered self-defense to kill him. Not murder, self-defense. Okay, he killed him, but it wasn't murder. It's the distinction there again, okay? Um, why? I think, I think it's just assumed at night, you don't know why he's breaking in. You don't know if he's breaking in to steal some things. You don't know if he's breaking in to do harm. Um, so the homeowner was not considered a murderer if he killed the thief. Instead, it was considered self-defense. However, like verse 3 says, if the thief breaks in during the day, then it's considered murder for the homeowner to kill him. Again, I think, I'm, I'm assuming, um, because during the day, it could be observed why he was breaking in. Why was he breaking in? To steal. <clears throat> Not to do physical harm. 
So it would be considered murder to take someone's life because they stole property, but it would be um, self-defense if it's at night and you don't know why they're breaking it. Um, <clears throat> one, uh, one commentator on this passage, he, he explains, the Mosaic Code sought to protect human life, even that of criminals. Why? Because people are made in the image of God. We have value because we are made in the image of God. And so God's law seeks to protect human life, even those who are criminals. The thief was either to compensate for the crime with his own material wealth, and if he couldn't do that, he's to be sold into slavery. So taking someone's life for theft is murder. But taking someone's life out of self-defense, they're doing you harm, is not murder. And I think that distinction is very clear in those verses right there. Um, turn with me a moment to, you may want to just like jot down that passage. That, that's important. Turn with me a moment to um, Psalm. I'll take you to a few other passages here. Psalm 18. Psalm 18. And beginning in verse number 30. Psalm 18, verses 30 to 34. If you're there, say amen. All right. It says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. For who is God save the Lord? Or who is a rock save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to, what? War, so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Was David wrong to write those words? Was he wrong? No, of course not. Did he, is he misrepresenting God? No, of course not. Was it actually the devil who taught his hands to war? No, no. Turn with me to Psalm 144. Psalm 144. And once you found that, could somebody please read just verse number one? Psalm 144, verse number one. Bless me, the Lord, my strength, that teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Thank you, thank you, Pastor. I think it's clear. Fighting is not always sinful. How could it be? How could it be if God taught David to war? Right? It's, it's, okay, turn with me to uh, Luke chapter number 3. Luke chapter number 3 and verse number 7. Luke chapter number 3 and verse number 7. This is the ministry of John the Baptist. Watch what he says. We'll read verse 7 to 14. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees, Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answereth and said unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized. And he said unto him, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him. Who's he talking about now in verse 14? The soldiers, talking to John the Baptist, what shall we do? And he said unto them, step away from being a soldier. Is that what he says? No, he says, do violence to no man. We'll talk about what that means in just a minute. Neither accuse any falsely and be content with your wages. And, and as the people were in expect, and he goes on. So notice his, his words to the soldiers. Did he tell them they needed to resign from being soldiers? No, that's not what he did. That phrase, do violence to no man, does not imply that they needed to step away from being soldiers. That word um, literally means to shake violently. 
It referred to extorting money by force or threat of violence. So if the use of weapons and fighting is wrong, this was the perfect time for John the Baptist to say, repent, turn away from that, right? And that's not what he said. Instead, he says, don't extort money from people, don't falsely accuse people, and be content with your wages. Turn over to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 and verse number 35. And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and what? And buy one. For I say unto you that this, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. Um, I've, I've, some people say that what that really means is that's enough talk about swords. <laughs> Which is, yeah, <laughs> which is crazy. He just told them, sell your garment and buy a sword, Right? So that wouldn't, that wouldn't make sense. It's very clear Jesus wanted his disciples to be armed. Right? I think that's, that's the plain reading of the, of the passage. He was going to be crucified very soon, which meant that his disciples would be in danger. Not long after this, when the soldiers come to arrest Jesus, what does Peter do? He, he swings, and apparently he wasn't very good with a sword, and cuts off Malchus's ear. Right? Jesus tells him to put his sword away. It's clear. Jesus did not want his disciples to have weapons in order to prevent him from going to the cross. Nor did he want them to have weapons to advance the kingdom of God. He wanted them to have weapons so they could defend themselves. That's it. Turn with me to Acts chapter number 10. Acts chapter number 10. And verse number 1. Acts chapter number 10. This is Luke writing again. Acts chapter number 10, verse number 1. And uh, can somebody read verses 1 and 2, please? Thank you, brother. All right, so here we're introduced to this man named Cornelius. Luke tells us that he was a centurion, which was a Roman officer who had command of about a hundred men. And he's called a devout man and one that feared God. So apparently, apparently, it's possible to use weapons and be a God-fearing person at the same time. Right? So the Bible sees no disjunction between those two things. If God views the use of weapons as always evil, then why would the Holy Spirit have guided Luke to call Cornelius a devout and God-fearing man? That wouldn't make any sense. If weapons are always bad, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be impossible to be devout and God-fearing in the military? I would think so. I would think. So there's probably more passages that we could look at, but I think these give a lot of evidence that the Bible is not against self-defense or the use of weapons. Now, we need to consider passages that gun control advocates use. Um, and I, I, I had read an article by a guy who, uh, by, by a Christian guy who was advocating for gun control, and I wish that I would have printed it out or something so I could just read you what he said. Um, but let me, let me just take you to, uh, we're just going to go to two passages that I think kind of summarize this. The first one is in Matthew 5. Matthew chapter number 5. I don't think anyone in here is against weapons or against defending yourself. <laughs> but 
The question is, do we know why from the Bible? Or is that just how we were raised? We're just red-blooded Americans. That's just the way we are. You know? I, don't, I love being American, but I want to follow the Bible. Right? If the Bible's against weapons, if the Bible's against defending yourself, then that's where we should be at. So what does the Bible... That's the question. That's, that's the question... And so we need, to, we need to know where to go. We need to know what the scriptures say about this. So some people think that Jesus was against all self-defense when he said, turn the other cheek. Okay, look at Matthew chapter number 5. And verses, look at verse 38, please. Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 38. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And, and he goes on. <clears throat> okay. In these verses, Jesus is not commanding us to let evil run rampant in our communities. He's not commanding us to refrain from standing against evil. Instead, he's talking about, and this is important, he's talking about private retaliation. Private retaliation. It, ha it has nothing to do with self-defense. It has everything to do with taking personal vengeance. Personal vengeance. That word smite, did you see it there in verse number 39? He says, Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. So this was most likely... A, a backhanded slap on the face, okay? Um, and, this, and this is key. So this, I couldn't find a backhanded slap, but <laughs> you get the idea. So that word smite refers to a sharp slap. This is important. Given an insult. Given an insult. So Jesus, get it. Jesus is commanding his followers not to hit back when someone hits you as an insult. That's what he's getting at. He's not talking about someone who attacks you violently with intent to do bodily harm. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about someone who insults you. They insult you, you turn the other cheek. You don't take personal vengeance on that person, even though that's what we want to do in our sinful nature, right? But Jesus says, no, no, you turn the other cheek. Um, so, so it's not about self-defense. That's not what this passage is about. Look at, um, or the use of weapons. Look at uh, Matthew 22. Matthew chapter number 22. And can someone please read uh, verse 39? Thank, thank you, brother. And on these two commandments, right? Loving God from verse 37, loving neighbors thyself, hang all the law and the prophets, verse number 40. So is self-defense and the use of weapons loving? Is that loving? Jesus is quoting, and it may, it may have it, the reference there off to the side in your Bible there, but he's quoting from Leviticus 19.18. So here in the law of Moses, there is a command to love your neighbor as yourself. Sometimes we think of that that was just a New Testament thing. That was in the Old Testament. Love your neighbor as yourself, Leviticus 19.18. But remember, also in the law of Moses, Exodus 22, verse number 2, what we just looked at at the beginning, it was not wrong to kill, to take the life of an intruder who breaks into your house at night. So we're left with two options. Either God is contradicting himself, because in one place he says, love your neighbor as yourself, and in another place he says it's acceptable to take someone's life if they, if they um, break into your home at night, or killing a nighttime intruder and loving your neighbor as yourself are not incompatible. See, most people, though, I think, view those things as incompatible. 
If you really love your neighbor as yourself, you would never take someone's life. It's not that it's not like we want to take someone's life. Okay, it's not it's not that. But um, if someone breaks into your home at night, you don't know why they're breaking into your home. The law of God says it's not murder to take their life. And so if God says that, and he also says love your neighbor as yourself, those, those two ideas must fit together with no problem at all. And I have no problem accepting that. Now, so it must be true that it is possible to both love your neighbor as yourself and practice self-defense. Does that make sense? Okay, so on top of this, listen to some of the, I just want to read you some statistics a moment about gun control and concealed carry. I'm going to put these up here. New Jersey adopted what was described as the most stringent gun law in America in 1966, and two years later, the homicide rate had increased 46%, and the reported robbery rate had doubled after Hawaii adopted a series of increasingly restrictive measures on guns, its murder rate, uh, I th yeah, I think that is what it's supposed to be. Thank you, brother. Tripled from 2.4 per 100,000 in 1968 to 7.2 in 1977. The District of Columbia enacted one of the most restrictive gun control laws in the country, and the murder rate has increased 134%, at the same time that the national murder rate decreased by 2%. A major study of the impact of gun control laws by, Fl by Florida State University criminologist Gary Kleck showed that in general, they had no significant effect on decreasing rates of violent crime or suicide or suicide. Look at this. In 2003, a 2003, excuse me, review of published studies on gun control released by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention could not find any statistically significant decrease in crime that came from such laws. As a result of a massive study of state gun control laws, author John Lott concluded that allowing citizens to carry concealed weapons clearly leads to a reduction in crime this is because a potential criminal will not know whether a possible victim is carrying a gun or not. <laughs> and this is a significant deterrence to crime. Sounds like common sense. Now that research is at least 12 years old. Some of it is more than 20 years old. So it could be worse now. But based on these statistics, if carrying a weapon reduces crime, wouldn't it be a loving thing to carry a weapon? Could it be could it be that carrying a weapon is a way to love your neighbor? I don't know. Could it be? I'm not suggesting that every Christian has to own a gun or have a concealed carry license. I'm not suggesting that at all. But I think it's clear that gun control is not beneficial to society. Weapons in the hands of good people is beneficial to society. So, We've considered the distinction between murdering and killing. Again, hugely important, foundational to this whole topic. There's a distinction between those things. We've looked at passages that seem to support self-defense and the use of weapons. We looked at many of those. We've considered at least two passages. I think probably the primary two, reason, two uh, passages or arguments used by gun control advocates I think it's clear that the Bible is not against self-defense or the use of weapons. Instead, the Bible supports the practice of self-defense and the proper use of weapons. And so our position should be what the Bible says, right? That's what being a Christian is all about. The Bible is our authority. So I, uh, yeah, so I want to leave you with that and challenge you with that. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. And Lord, thank you so much for the guidance and the direction and the wisdom that it gives to us. And God, I ask that you would uh, edify us through, these, through this, uh, these passages of scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. uh, do you guys understand the whole slap thing, why he said it was insult? Because most people are right-handed, right? Here. Yeah.
So if I'm going to, come here, Jason. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm left-handed, so that's what we can. So if you're going to hit somebody, where would I hit him? What's, what side is this? Left side. That's right. But if I hit him this way, that's what it's talking about, hit him with the right hand. That's what he talked about, an insult. It's a backhanded slap. Right? You also notice the CDC's little thing there. I don't know if you picked up on that. There's no statistical decrease. Didn't say anything about increase. So that's just that you got to be really cognizant about how they word things because they want to hide truth and say, well, they looked. There was no statistical decrease. Yeah, but there was an exponential increase. <laughs> so, um, also, the, when the founding of our nation, you remember, you were required to own a gun and to maintain it. Um, you had to carry a gun on the way to church. It was law that you had to do that because um, the woods you'd walk through going to church. And I remember here, it's been 20 years, no, it's probably been 20 years ago, we're heading down, I was listening to WLS, of all things, out of, out of Chicago, and this was after it was a music station, this was a talk radio, and the guys were talking, he says, yeah, there's a little town, there's a town in Illinois, it's still today, you're required to own a gun and maintain it if you're a citizen of that community. And he said, after the break, I'll tell you who it is. I gotta look it up. So I looked it up, and of all places, it was Palmer, Illinois. Palmer is a town of 200 people. That's right there where we lived. My aunt lived in Palmer. <laughs> and I said, hey, that's something good for Palmer. The town kind of creeped me out at times, but I was kind of, uh, um, <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, trust me. In fact, they had, a, they had a deer, 300 pounds, come out. That was the ugliest deer that <laughs> you talk about. Yeah, I don't know if it was or not, man. He had a strung him out in his front tree. And, uh, anybody got any comments on that? Good job tonight, Douglas, as always. Uh, yes, ma'am. You know what? Hold on a second, honey. Hey, you can get that because people online are, are not going to be able to. <clears throat> to here, and if we could get that on, that'd be great. Darlene's gonna sing for us before she does that. <laughs> there you go. A lot of the point goes back to the Old Testament as well, and I remember Don's mom always used to have a hard time with the Old Testament. I don't understand why God would tell them to go and kill everybody mm -hmm. in town and even kill babies. So, but that's not murder if uh, God commands it yeah. because he's got mm. perfectly good reason. So, yeah, yeah I don't it, understand it. There's, I, right. And I've questioned that myself. And uh, I don't understand it. But I know there's a lineage for the Lord Jesus Christ that had to be protected. That might have been part of it too. I'm not sure. Yeah. Anybody else got one? Right? Oh, hold on. Got to get that thing back there. People online are watching, and they're going to wonder, what's he saying? Yeah. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> you look great. You look great. Uh, Jesus told his disciples when they were pulling swords to protect him in the garden, he said, you don't think that I can call 12 legions of yeah. angels? So even he was like, I can defend myself, yeah. you know, if I need to. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, let me say this also. If you, if you are going to carry a weapon, get a concealed carry. I, I, I'm not against open carry. I just think it's dumb um, because you've identified yourself. And if somebody's going to come in shooting people up, look at the guy with the gun on his hip. You know, shoot him first. You know, I saw on that thing there was a, a, a lady with a, a sidearm on her side out in public. Well, that may be a bold, obstinate statement. That was dumb. You know, you, don't, you just don't do that. So if you're going to do it, make sure. I would suggest you conceal carry, though you have a right to open carry. But it's just not a good idea. If your whole purpose is self-defense, defense of others, that's what you need to do. All right. All right, somebody else? Somebody else got a word? Right. I had to do this, Doug, because it was like 8.02 when you got done. I like I can't let them out that early, man. Yeah. 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 Just, just a comment on the can 
uh, self-defense, <coughs> be loving your neighbor. And it, it, you know, it's somebody who's going to come in and do bodily harm to you or your family isn't going to stop there. Sure. They're going to go That's on it. to the next and sure. the next. And so defending yourself in the end for the community is loving your neighbor. Yeah, that person, your neighbor's over here also. Right. So, yeah, exactly right. I crossed my mind when he was talking about that same thing. It, uh, good, good observation. All right, somebody else? Anybody else got a word on that? If you don't have a, you know, I thought about having a concealed, uh, get, get a group of guys. I'd like to get our ladies a concealed carries. Uh, how many ladies would be interested in that? Nobody's looking on camera, so one, two, three, four, five, six, so six, seven, seven of our ladies. That's a pretty good class right there. We can almost have our own class and uh, with seven. Okay, I'll look into it. I'll look into it. How many guys would be interested in a concealed carry? One, two, holy scamoli. Okay. Well, I'll just look into getting a guy, getting somebody to come here and teach it. And then we'll have to go to a firing range. You've got to have a firing range. To, uh, or we'll host it at a firing range somewhere. Okay, yeah, because we got, that's, that was almost 20 people right there. And, uh, so we'll do that. All righty. Good, 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 good. All right. What about anything else? All right. All right. Well, great job, guys. All right, well, let's stand together. All right. Anything else? Nothing big going on this week, right? Starting on Sunday, we're going to do a week. You know how we did the month? Um, Phil Michigan, how, we, how many tracks we could pass out in a month? We're going to do that the week of Easter from Sunday to Sunday from Palm Sunday, which is this Sunday, to Easter Sunday, through Easter Sunday. We're gonna do that, see how many uh, tracks we can get out and just from just our people. It's, it's part of a, there's a whole Phil Michigan. We did that Phil Michigan thing, and other churches in other states wanted to get involved. Um, I think, if I understood, there's like 34 states or something now that wanna get part of it too. So it's starting to grow, be nationwide thing. and. Um, so that's kind of neat. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna do that. So make sure you get loaded up on that. Oh, and did I mention? Yeah, and don't forget, ladies, about Sunday. You gotta get those Sunday school manuals. Um, it's gonna start. We got a week and a half before that class starts. So get that. And uh, because this week and then Easter Sunday starts the, the division of the, the ladies start class starts their own thing again, and the guys will have their own thing in here. So uh, we'll do that. Okay. I guess got it. I got it. <laughs> All right. Father, I want to say thank you for today. and It's been a good day. And, and uh, Lord, I, I ask your guidance over our life that uh, we would be cognizant of our responsibilities to you. We're getting down to the end. I mean, we're seeing everything that's going on. It's remarkable the things that I am seeing nearly every day now, the last oh, couple of weeks or so, everything moving at an exponential rate toward the revelation and uh, toward the tribulation period. And Lord, I want to thank you for that, to know that we have Christ, that uh, you've saved us from the wrath to come. And Lord, I want to thank you for that. I ask your blessing upon these dear folks. Thank you for them coming out tonight. They didn't have to come tonight, but they did. They've invested the time that they'll never, ever get again. And they've invested it in your house and in the teaching of your word. Thank you for them. God, give us Godspeed as we travel our separate way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.